Well, um, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for for coming. Um, this is funded by the National Geographic Society. They gave me a grant to do some professional development for school districts to be able to increase geographic learning and raise a little bit of environmental literacy in students as well. So the presentation I'm gonna do today is going to focus on how to use citizen or community science in order to accomplish the goals of increasing um, environmental literacy at the same time as creating globally minded students. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if this, this works. All right, can we all see? I'm good, Marissa. Okay, all right, we can all see that. Great. So I know, I know many of you um, who have taught me and had to deal with that, um, but I, I'm not familiar with everyone here, so I'd like to go around and kind of get to know you a little bit. If you could tell me, obviously, your name and then what your subject is that you teach um, and then any experience that you have with citizen or community science. So obviously, I am Marissa Jacobs. Um, I teach pre-K through retiree environmental and conservation education and I do citizen science on the daily. That's part of, part of my career. Who would like to go next? Uh, I'm Mike Pasco. I teach uh, ninth grade general science here at the high school in Jim Thorpe. I also teach marine science and I have um, zero experience with the citizens of community science. Mike Pope, I teach AP Chemistry, Chemistry, and General Science, um, 11th, 12th, and 9th grade, and I also have zero experience with uh, community science. Paul Eicherberger, um, hey Marissa, um, um, Biology, Advanced Biology, Anatomy and Physiology, anything else? I think that's it, and zero as well. Frank Miller, uh, biology, ecology, and environmental sciences at the high school. Um, zero experience with citizen science. Nate hey, go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nate. Oh, sorry, Pam. Nate Donahue, seventh and eighth grade science at the L.B. Morris. I have zero experience with this. <clears throat> All right, I'll jump in then. Sorry, we're all echoing here. Um, Pam McAmoyle, and I teach, can you guys mute yours? Oh, you do? Why am I echoing? Maybe I should walk away. Um, I teach seventh and eighth grade STEM uh, now, but I taught science as well. I'm gonna walk over into my other room here so they can't hear me. Um, and I actually have a lot of experience um, in this area with like citizen science. I taught at an environmental charter school for three years. We integrated everything and got to get the kids outside and always had like projects we would do in the community. Um, so this is like my jam. I'm really excited to be here. And I feel like all these teachers that I had that are on here, Mr. Pope, you just started out when I was coming, Mr. E, um, when we were in high school. Um, so I'm kind of excited on the flip side here. Maybe I could teach you guys something. Yeah, sorry about that, Pam. I think that it's because I set up camp so close to you. <laughs> um, I'm Susan Rudlow. I teach middle school science and uh, four through eight computer science. I also have zero experience with the community science. Mike Wagner, I teach environmental science and earth science out of Penn Kidder, and I have zero experience too. 
Hi, Jay Llewellyn. I teach uh, seventh and eighth grade science, earth space, and environmental science at the LB. I'm also an English teacher. Hi, I'm Hannah Zoba. I'm Michelle Lawrence's uh, sub, so I'll be teaching seventh and eighth math and STEM. Any, did we miss anyone? I think we went all the way around. Yeah. I, I, hi, I'm Faye Gore. I'm representing National Geographic Education. I'm super excited to um, be able to sit in on Marissa's session today. So I'm here to just listen and learn. And I've actually was a social studies uh, teacher um, in my day. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, all the great things that you're going to learn today. Excellent. Not going to lie, that's kind of what I expected of experience with citizen or community science. Um, the fact that there was one person was really cool. This is something that is kind of gaining in popularity and has been able to really impact students learning in the classroom and as they go into their real world lives. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction to National Geographic Society and their education programs and what I've been able to go through and how that's been able to impact my teaching. Um, so I am a certified educator and you can do that. It's a free program. And the goal is just to give teachers that are committed to creating the next generation of explorers and conservationists some tools to be able to better equip those next generation of decision makers. They have something called the learning framework, which I have now been able to integrate into all of my lessons or all of my units or activities that I'm doing with my students in an outdoor environment. Um, we focus on connecting the human and natural world. So we take a look at the various scales of local, regional, global, and all the perspectives that you see here, spatial, cultural, ecological, which for science teachers, adding ecological perspectives into lesson plans is not really that hard. However, when we are able to kind of integrate cultural or political education into our science curriculum, that's when students are really able to kind of make connections to real world applications and they're able to have a better understanding and picture of why they're learning what they're learning in the classroom. I know I hear from a lot of students that they have no idea how what they're learning at school is going to help them when they get out into whatever career they choose and they don't understand why they have to learn all this math, why they have to learn all this science, especially if that's something they're not interested in. And being able to tie in all of these different perspectives can kind of help to bring that connection a little closer for them. And then we have the National Geographic Learning Framework. And these points, they, they focus more on developmental and just critical thinking skills as opposed to the more academic skills that the skills and perspectives would bring to your lessons. And it focuses on attitudes like curiosity, responsibility, and empowerment, which for me, that's one that I really want to focus on, is being able to empower the students and to tell them that, yes, you can make a difference in the world, which is one reason why citizen science is something that I take a lot of pride in and participate in a lot because it can really empower students. Then you have their skills of observation, communication, collaboration, and problem solving. Again, with citizen or community science, you are going to be, students are gonna be recording observations that they make. So that's a skill that they're gonna be greatly increasing. And all of this helps them to develop these skills in the classroom, and then they can take it out of the classroom and be able to apply that to their everyday lives. And then their 
knowledge points of the framework. We have um, learning about the human story. National Geographic is very interested and their goal is to, you know, be explorers and be storytellers. So we want to know where we've come from, where we're going. And it's really great when we can combine that with looking at how the planet is changing, how the environment is changing, and how the wildlife that lives in those biomes and those habitats are changing as well. And then they have another course that I have also taken of geo inquiry, which is really getting students to take a deeper look at whatever topic they're learning about. They ask deeper questions. It kind of goes, the ask step kind of goes hand in hand with the scientific method where you have the hypothesis, except this ask step goes a little deeper. And they, the students are the ones who are trying to figure out what questions they personally have about the topic that then leads them to go out and collect data that helps to potentially answer that question. Then they'll create uh, visual infographics, um, charts, graphs. They'll learn more about data visualization that helps to support what they have collected. And then they'll learn how to create a presentation, and oftentimes I've been seeing some others who have also gone through this geo inquiry process, they will go and they will create a presentation to give to local policymakers or to municipalities who would have the power to look at the data that the students have collected and be able to say, wow, thank you for bringing this to us. We will consider this, we will add this into our decision-making process. And a lot of local municipalities have been able to use that data to create a change in their community. And then there's the ACT phase, which kind of goes along with a lot of the students talking to their local policymakers. However, it could also be students wind up by creating an event that the community can get involved in, whether it's a community tree planting or um, like a litter cleanup day, that students get to take what they have learned about their question that they asked originally and make a difference. So I have all of the links down there at the bottom as well. These are all free. So I would definitely recommend checking them out. So now action-based learning um, is kind of when we take what we're learning in the classroom and we do a project that can impact the real world um, outside of the classroom. So I'm calling Mr. Pope out for this one. I took his Chem 2 class and this was one of the very impactful lessons that I remember from high school where we created biodiesel out of cafeteria grease. And this was at the same time that we were learning about real world chemistry applications. And we got to go through the whole process and make biodiesel. I don't think the biodiesel that I made was all that great, but it was still really interesting to see that, wow, this is how what I'm learning in the classroom impacts they can be done by real world scientists when I get out of the classroom. And I also feel like I'm making something, I am doing something action based. So are there any ways, other than this biodiesel one, Mr. Pope, um, but are there any ways that you have been able to integrate kind of this action based learning in your classroom? Marissa, I think I use your biodiesel in my Volkswagen uh, diesel engine, so I, I think it was pretty good, just to okay. let you know. <laughs> Excellent.
I'm going over in my room so I can talk a little bit more, but um, some things that I did with my kids when I was at 7 Gen, and I haven't done as much here at Jim Thorpe yet, but I try to integrate some stuff like that we did with getting the garden grant a couple years ago, um, which um, has been amazing. Wagner has been amazing and Kinsey and all the custodians, and everybody helping out with that and trying to do some real world stuff. Um, but one thing that I did at 7 Gen was like going along kind of with biodiesel, like we were looking at the buses and the kids wanted to know about the pollutants coming out of the buses and like how bad it really was. And so we collected data, the kids, the bus drivers let the kids go over. And I mean, we had to be safe about it and they might've been more lenient than you could be here sometimes, but we were able to take shirts, white t-shirts and we'd go over and we'd cover up the, where the um, fumes were coming out and kind of get to see, and we would be comparing different things. Um, I forget all the details of everything we did with it, but I mean, it was just really cool for the kids to come up with their own questions and then be able to find ways to investigate it. Um, and they came up with how we should do it. And then they, you know, compiled their data and then they were able to present it. And we didn't go as far as um, the like whole community there. Like sometimes we did parents, we always had to do gallery walks, but we would do stuff that we'd present it to the whole school at least. Um, so, I mean, we did stepping stones. Right. Nice. I've done the dirty sock is what we called it, where we would put the, the socks on exhaust pipes of cars to see which cars were more efficient than others. That's yeah. A good one. Yeah. Anything else along those lines that you guys have been able to do? Okay. Well, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be inspired or have some ideas to be able to take your classroom learning and um, bring it to your students in kind of a new way. Yeah, I think um, one other thing, if you don't mind me talking, yeah, I don't want to be taking this whole presentation here, but um, we did a lot of stuff with plastic bag use as well. Uh, the kids, you know, were interested in that and we watched that movie Bag It. Um, it is more higher level. Um, I probably wouldn't do it below eighth grade, maybe. I mean, I would get permission, but um, it was a really good movie. If you haven't seen it, um, a good documentary just about plastic use and where all this stuff goes and the giant garbage patch in the ocean. And I mean, the kids really looked into it. And then we ended up coming up with a petition. So we had all community members come and we had our like usual gallery walk that we would have with everything they did for the quarter. But then they would also, um, we had parents pledge that they would do different things like take reusable containers when they go out to dinner instead of using the styrofoam or instead of using the plastic bags um, for you know, the grocery store, making sure you're taking your reusable bags. So they would pledge what they wanted to, but it was something that could make an impact and make a change in the community. Nice, and it's always great to start parents out with something small like that because even mm -hmm. one little thing, if done, over and over can make a huge difference. Absolutely. That's I know great. we all have those big bags of more garbage bags in our cabinet. Yeah. Yes, I, I definitely, definitely do. <laughs> all right. So that's some cool stuff that Pam is doing. Um, and then finally with the Nat Geo, some of their education programs, they also have something called the Explorer Classroom. And I find this is really cool um, to show to students where you can kind of search through all of their different explorers, see who's going to be talking. And this is great virtually. It's done virtually even outside of COVID. So it's a great thing to integrate now. Um, if you're looking for something to do, it kind of gets to introduce your students to those real world explorers and scientists out there. They can talk a little bit about what they do out, how their research is impacting the world, how the students can get involved, how they can help, and how it connects to their classroom learning as well. Um, and there is a list if you, um, there's set up Explorer Classroom days, so you would have to kind of apply for your classroom to get into that virtual learning environment. Um, but if there's not one that's coming up, they do have a really large list of explorers that you can filter by subject. So you can type in, I'm looking for explorers that have to do with marine biology or um, general environmental science or just STEM. And it'll pop up with all sorts of explorers from around the world 
and you can read a little bit more about them and again introduce your students to these are people who are taking what we're learning here and they're doing it out in the real world making the planet a better place because they learned about this stuff and i have within the past I think it's now been a year that I've been doing this. I have also been a mentor for the education certification that Nat Geo does. And it's been really interesting for me to then get to talk to all of these teachers and see their experience with it. So one of my students in the last cohort that we had um, was amazed by how when he combined the ecological and historical perspectives, his students really got into the project. It was a um, sustainability and zero waste sort of project that he had done with his students. And it turned into more of what was supposed to be just a reflection on their plastic consumption and use into an action project because he was able to tie those different perspectives in. Um, others like Trina, she works in a low income minority district in Cleveland, Ohio. And her student population is most described, she said is disengaged, is the most appropriate word to use for her students. And the entire faculty through the education certification was blown away with how many students actually then participated in the projects, how many were engaged, even those that never really wanted to do anything, wouldn't even hand in work, now wanted to participate because they could see the purpose and the reason behind what they were learning in class. All right, so now we move on to citizen or community science. You may have heard both words. Citizen science is kind of what I started hearing about and then very recently, like within the past year, um, they have started making a switch to calling citizen science community science because people felt that the word community was a little more inclusive, didn't restrict as much as the word citizen did. So you may hear both terms. They refer to the same, the same thing of just collection and analysis of data typically relating to the natural or biological world and it's a collaboration sort of between the public and the scientist. So a scientist or a research professional would say, hey, I need this data for my project. I don't have time to do that. I don't have the ability to go to every single continent in the world and get the data that I need. Public, here's how you collect the data, go do it. And there are really, really great ones. Um, some are definitely more dry and advanced where it is just pure data collection. You go out into the field, like the bumblebee watch is just finding bumblebees, identifying them, and then recording the data, which I think is fun. I like watching bumblebees, but it may not be the best for uh, increasing engagement in students. Um, Others are more game styled. So for example, the last one, iWire, is done by neurologists and it's taking a look at mapping neural networks in, obviously in the brain, but in regards to eyesight. And you get to color in the neurons and then it creates a scientific model. So it's, it's very gamey, it has very cool, like sci-fi music and, it's fun to try to connect all the different pieces of the neurons together. Um, you can get points and rewards for it. So that one might be more engaging for the students to try out. And then ultimately through that one, the scientists are getting back full scientific models of the neural pathways. Today though, we're gonna focus on a tool that I have used for many different citizen science projects called iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is really great um, for using regardless of age. I've had preschoolers who are able to use it. I use it. I've had really, really, really old people 
who use it. So it crosses the age bracket. And now importance of scientific thinking. Obviously, we're all science educators. We know the importance of it. Um, however, a lot of the world doesn't see necessarily the importance of it. In the United States, we were ranked 20th, and this was back in 2016. I don't know how this ranking has changed. This was the most recent that I could find. Um, but we were ranked 20th in science education, and 69% of the student body was unprepared for college level science. And I know when I took bio with Mr. E, I am very glad that I did because when I went to school and then majored in biology and wildlife conservation, it was very intensive. And if I hadn't had that bio too, I would have not necessarily been unprepared because I, I know how to study, I have study tips, and I'm interested in it, but I would not have felt as confident as I had. And that's coming from someone who's really passionate about biology and very interested in it. Whoop, not whoop. everybody, yay! <laughs> not everyone is that way, right? Um, even if they're going into the science field, it's not necessarily biology that they're interested in, or if they're going into biology, they might not necessarily be interested in physics or math. So as we're looking at our science education, being able to incorporate ways to increase critical thinking or observation skills, be able to ask those questions is really important in creating just a scientific thinker in the students. And then I took a look at some studies that compared in-classroom learning to outdoor or nature learning experiences. And it was pretty interesting how a lot of students, when they would go outside, they didn't necessarily understand what they were supposed to be learning outside. They just kind of enjoyed the outdoor time and getting to experience nature. And they saw that all of the academic learning that needs to be done so that you can go to college, that happens in the classroom. It's formal, it's all test prep, which is fine. But the staff was able to see in the student, the development in the students of how their social skills increased, self-confidence, creativity, problem solving skills, all of the more developmental critical thinking aspects increased in their students, which ultimately leads to the students doing better in the classroom. And this study looked at um, low income or minority school districts and how nature-based learning was able to cross all of the brackets. Wealthier students were able to enjoy the outdoor classroom environment just as much as low income students were. Um, they both had access to the same tree, the same plant, the same animal. When the kids would go outside, nobody cared about the socioeconomic boundaries that we have placed on people. Um, the white Caucasian kids enjoyed the outdoor experience just as much as the Latino and African American students did. So it really helps to bridge gaps if you're looking for ways to do that as well. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, I agree with that. And from what I saw, I mean, I worked at a school that had nine different districts coming together. And a lot of them were the inner city Allentown kids. And the difference that I saw in them when we did this kind of stuff together, we worked on a garden together and the kids got to do all the soil testing. I mean, they did everything. And just the changes that I saw in them. I had a girl who the beginning of the year was one of my biggest issues, like, you know, with interactions with other students and with me, she didn't respect me, she didn't care. Once we got through the gardening, I mean, it was a total 180. I mean, she just like changed immensely. She even bought a pack of seeds and she didn't have money. She brought in a pack of seeds and told me that she wanted me to use them with the kids the next year. Um, because it meant so much to her and she got so much out of it. Like it was incredible. That was like my life-changing moment right there with doing this kind of work. That is absolutely amazing. 
I yeah. love stories like that. I am. Um, there was a point in time where I worked for an urban ag farm in the Philadelphia school district. So very, very urban. And to hear them get excited about the fact that they saw a worm, they had never seen a worm before. That was like the type of wildlife that you saw on TV. They had seen a worm once. And that really impacted me to be able to say, wow, hands-on experiences in nature. I didn't think that, see I mean, I like worms, worms are cool, they're fine. But I didn't think that seeing a worm and getting their hands in, like mm -hmm. you said, in the soil or in the leaf litter would be that much of an impact, but it really is. So it really does. You never know where those impacts are gonna come from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And here's some other um, testimonials, I guess, or quotes from other educators. Again, these are some educators that I had the opportunity to mentor through NatGeo. And specifically, these two educators did bio blitzes, which is where you take an inventory of a set location or a set space in a short amount of time. And they both used iNaturalist, which we will get into. But they both found that regardless of age and location, um, the project was very different in Georgia than it was in Arizona where um, Jeanne was studying invasive buffalo grass in the Sonoran Desert. Very different project than the other ones we're doing, but they both saw an increase in engagement and that the kids were actually excited to go outside and discover things and that the students didn't really expect to find so much. So it really increased their observation skills and the students were coming back after their units saying, I found this in my backyard today or I found this other thing on the way to school. And they had never seen those things or never even knew to look for those creatures before. So it really opened up their eyes and got them to start observing things more on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, we're always looking for more ways to increase career exploration. Um, even in the middle school, middle school students, we're always looking for good ways to get them to think about what they're going to be doing and how they're going to contribute to society after school. And when you use citizen or community science, you are pretty much telling them right away, you're making a difference, you're contributing data, your observations are going somewhere. Somebody, some scientist out there is using the data that you have collected to make the world a better place and students feel empowered by that. And there's lots of different professionals if you're trying to think of ways to connect career exploration to you using community science in your classroom. Um, wildlife biologists, any environmental science, green industry workers. I had mentioned iWire, um, the community science game that was about new uh, neural pathways. So neurologists, pathologists are going to use this. Um, and then ultimately, because this is a collaborative effort and the data is made public, local municipalities are also able to access that data and say, um, for example, where I live right now, we have a meadow management project going on where the municipalities are trying to figure out their mowing schedule for the like the roadsides and the wide spans you get onto turnpikes and things like that and they've actually been able to go to iNaturalist which has all of the species data and look at the different plants and wildlife that have been found in the area to make better and more informed decisions. So regardless of, of fields, local municipalities don't often have real scientists on their, on their board or on their staff. So being able to have access to public data like that makes it, makes their job a lot easier. So thinking back to the National Geographic Learning Framework of Attitude, Skills, and Perspectives, how can we see a student participating in citizen science, 
what attitude skills or knowledge do you think that you can see the student gaining? Anybody? Okay. I feel like I was trying to let other people talk because I was always the one. That's all right. Stuff before, but I mean, I definitely see all these skills. I mean, when they're working together to come up with stuff, I mean, they're coming up with their own ideas and then, you know, that makes them invested in it. So then they're, you know, using those observations and they're communicating with each other, like for a purpose, which makes it more meaningful, you know, while they're collaborating. I mean, so many kids today, especially, I mean, I look at my niece and nephew and how they don't communicate as well with the the real world, you know, I don't think they do enough of that kind of stuff where they're working together on something meaningful that can actually make an impact on their community. Um, also, just picking up hobbies, you know, they've never been introduced to any of these things. And this is something after high school, college, when you're sitting around saying, boy, what do I do now besides work? <laughs> that they can actually think back and say, hey, wait a minute, I kind of enjoyed this. So hobbies. That's definitely a big one. Um, during COVID, there have been a lot of articles put out and studies put out by like the National Audubon Society, um, where suddenly there's an influx of younger kids participating in bird watching. And normally birding has been a very um, older person dominated field because it takes a lot of time to sit and just find a bird and then observe it for a while. So a lot of retirees have the time. Hey, what's with it. that old stuff there? <laughs> I don't know. Are you a bird watcher, Mr. E? No. No. Okay. <laughs> um, but a lot of people who are retired, they now have the time to do all these hobbies. And with COVID, kids are sitting around thinking, just like Mr. E said, of like, what, what do I do? And we're noticing an influx of younger people wanting to engage with the natural world. Yeah, and I think we need more people that are also involved in our community as they get older, um, being on like planning commissions, um, different boards, like zoning boards, that kind of stuff. And we need more citizens that are well-rounded like this, that have all those skills that they're able to contribute to the community so that they're making really good decisions for everyone in the township. Absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna give everybody a five minute break. Um, I see it is 9.45 ish, so we'll come back here at 9.50, coffee, stretch your legs, whatever you need to. And then we will get into the nitty gritty of iNaturalist and we will also have some hands-on experience with creating our own iNaturalist accounts and going outside too. So, all right, we will all meet back here at 950.
right, are we all back? Can't tell. Okay, that is now 9.53-ish, so I will jump back in. Hopefully everyone is back. Ooh, went too fast. All right, so we're getting into iNaturalist. This is a tool developed by the California Acad Academy of Sciences as well as National Geographic. They work together on it. And while iNaturalist itself is not a citizen science project itself, it can be used as a tool to help you complete other projects um, or just learn more about collaborative data collection. So iNaturalist is a documentation tool to monitor sightings of wild wildlife, whether it's plants, animals, fungi, anything living. Um, it even has the ability to identify if I were to take a picture and upload animal tracks. It has the ability to identify the animal that belongs to those tracks as well. And then we're going to look very briefly at SEEK, which is developed by iNaturalist. However, it's suited for younger students. Um, and we'll take a look at the uses and reasoning between using iNaturalist versus SEEK. Some of the learning benefits that other teachers have told me that they see in their classrooms or that I have seen as I'm using it with my students is that first off, it just creates excitement about biodiversity. And for students who are really going through a time of mass extinctions and we're hearing all these stories about all these animals that are being impacted by wildfires or natural disasters or plants that they see get mowed down to create developments. Um, being excited about biodiversity and all sorts of plants and animals is a, is a good thing. They're going to be more inclined to help protect those species later on in life. It's also going to develop a larger understanding of scientific documentation. They're going to go through step by step and be able to say, this is how I upload an image, that's my observation, but here are all the facets that I need to be able to include and know about to create quality data. Um, again, it enhances a sense of place and belonging. They're going to understand that they are in the world with these plants and animals. They have a responsibility to care for and protect these animals that live right alongside them. And with that increase of sense of place, it also increases that connection to the natural world, which is a good thing because the planet is nature. They need, students need to be able to live harmoniously with people and nature. This is a screenshot of Seek. So it is very user-friendly, um, more gamey than iNaturalist. Again, iNaturalist is more of the dry observation. You input your observation and the community at large can help identify um, if you're having trouble or if iNaturalist doesn't get it right away. Um, but SEEK can have little games. The more you observe, the more badges you learn. So for younger students, this can be more motiva uh, motivational and encouraging for them to want to participate in it. And here is a graph that kind of shows the difference between SEEK and iNaturalist to help you decide if one of them is better than the other for your classroom. So SEEK you can have and it's any age. For iNaturalist, you have to be 13 years old or older to use it. So some of the younger middle school students may not be able to use iNaturalist. And this is all to protect privacy because with iNaturalist, you're collecting data 
you're collecting locations, addresses, latitude and longitude, and that's being out there public. So you want to definitely think about their privacy before you just jump right into iNaturalist. Um, but for Seek, there's no account creation required. You can just kind of store your observations um, and that, that's that. But on iNaturalist, again, to increase quality data collection, an account is required. And I mentioned about the location. Um, when you input an observation into iNaturalist, it does want you to include the GPS coordinates for that sighting so that if someone um, were to say, wow, there's a bog turtle, an endangered species in the, in the forest behind the high school, maybe somebody wants to go check that out and say, wow, is this, is this real? We'll go and observe the area, check for this endangered bog turtle. Um, but for SEEK, it's kind of just for students to use for their own fun. Location is used. However, it's not stored in the app like it is in iNaturalist. Again, for SEEK, there's no internet connection required. So this can be something if you went out to the forest behind PK or behind LB or at the high school, um, you could go out and start observing things right away. Whereas with iNaturalist, you can observe things, but you can't upload it to the community database until you get back to an area with Wi-Fi. So there's just like another little step to iNaturalist, um, but you'll, you'd still be able to ultimately use it. Seek is, again, because it, it starts out for a younger audience, it also is better than for students that are just getting started in learning how to explore or how to observe nature. If your students already have more of those observation skills, iNaturalist might be a better way because it allows you to do the observation yourself and then contribute that data to the community science and to the community of iNaturalist for sharing that data. Um, if you are in iNaturalist and you don't know what species you just photographed, that's okay because you can upload your unknown observation, not a problem. You know, you can just type in, this is a plant, that's as much as I know. And the community, if iNaturalist can't identify it right away for you using its um, image recognition software, then the community can go in and explore and say, oh, I know what that plant is because I'm a botanist and I know these things. Or I don't know what those animal tracks are that I took a picture of, but maybe a mammologist happens to see the track and know exactly what it is and can help you suggest some identifications. With SEEK, there is none of that community. Again, because privacy is such an issue with SEEK, you're going to miss out on that shared community aspect, but it's in favor of having more privacy for your students. National Geographic also has a teacher's kind of um, guide and teacher's area where they have a whole bunch of education resources. And I do include the link um, later on for that as well. These are all free resources for if you are trying to have your own bio blitz or just are going out and trying to identify species, learning how to collect data, these are all worksheets that they have developed for you already if you would like to use them. So when we use iNaturalist, we can do this in person or virtually. I know I've had a bunch of teachers who started um, in the last cohort that I was able to mentor for National Geographic's educator certification. That was back in the spring, and that's when a lot of schools started going and moving towards virtual learning. And it was still amazing how students are able to do this on their own. They don't need a classroom for this. So it's, it's a helpful tool to have in your virtual learning toolbox right now. Um, and again, this is, I know we're all science and STEM teachers here, but this can be 
a useful tool for any sort of interdisciplinary learning. If you are trying to collaborate with a social studies teacher or collaborate with even an art teacher, um, there is a, a bridge there that we can form with some other educators, again, to help build those connections that students have. So for science, we're learning about biodiversity, we're learning about taxonomy and classification. For technology teachers, we can take a look at scientific modeling and data visualization that iNaturalist has. Or I've even had a teacher who used iNaturalist as um, a high school tech teacher. He was teaching his students how to create apps and they were looking at app usage around the world and iNaturalist was one of the apps that they took a look at. Um, social studies, there are so many maps and um, all sorts of graphs that iNaturalist has available to explore. And you can monitor data collection over a period of time and look at historical patterns, or you can even go to the map and take a look at what um, Zimbabwe has been able to document through iNaturalist. You can look at those patterns and maybe find a biome that's similar to the biome in Jim Thorpe and one overseas and be able to take a look at patterns there. You can, as a math teacher, you can investigate graphing and charting. You're monitoring population growth um, and lots of statistics. With art photo composition, as you're taking a picture of your subject of the, the observation, photo composition, lighting, filling frames is all very important in order to document a quality observation. And then, of course, you have um, ELA and language teachers. So if you are learning about different styles of writing and are saying, well, we just did a unit on creative writing, now we're going to move into a unit on scientific writing and looking at the nuances of both of those, you could use reports from iNaturalist to help you learn more about scientific writing. Um, other educators, like a Spanish teacher, might look at the data found in Spain and talk about the maybe cultural importances that those species have. Um, for example, like marigolds are really important in Day of the Dead celebrations in Mexico. So maybe a teacher can take a look at the observations of native marigolds found in Mexico around the time of Day of the Dead celebrations and be able to tie things in that way. So again, I know we're all STEM and science teachers here, but are there any ways that just looking at community science or learning more about it that you can see being able to collaborate with another teacher down the hallway or in a totally different um, side of the building? Art teachers having them draw the plants or the animals that they've seen. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. Botanical illustration is very important in increasing scientific awareness. So that's a good one. Any other ideas before I move on? Okay, well, I know a lot of us are very new to citizen science, so hopefully over time you'll be able to come up with some ideas to increase collaboration. Um, we have some teacher tips, again, when using iNaturalist, when using this app, it's really helpful if teachers have their own practice with it. They have their own account, they've set it up so that, of course, when students ask questions, we have the answers for them, or at least know where to go to find those answers. And when we get into the app, we're going to see an explore tab. This tab is so important for the actual um, community, looking at data from around the world, looking at different graphs, and being able to 
use multiple perspectives, not just a scientific one, but a cultural or an artistic one as well. So I have here for you the resource list from National Geographic that does include those um, data collection sheets that I had showed you. It also includes almost an infinite number of other worksheets and things to get inspired by if you're trying to do a bio blitz or just take an inventory of species in your area. I also included the link for the iNaturalist Teacher's Guide and the Seek User Guide if you were going to use those in your classroom. It might be a good thing to look over as a refresher before you have your students jump in. That way you have a better idea of what is happening. But now we are going to do the hands-on part. So if we could all get our phones, this is all that students need to be able to do, um, to do an observation. Or if, you know, no phones, um, I know no phones in classroom right now, that's really hard to say to a virtual learning student, but you could also take a picture with a camera or with your phone still and upload on a computer. So. If you have a computer, you can also download it there. It's just really hard to take your computer out and do observations that way. But it is a free app for iPhones or Androids. Um, once you have the account open, um, you've created your account, you can um, visit a little section that's my observations, depending on if you have an iPhone or an Android. Um, the, the little green plus sign might change corners of the phone. Um, but once you have downloaded iNaturalist, we are actually going to practice making observations. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to download iNaturalist. If you do it super quickly um, and want, you can also download Seek, um, S-E-E-K but we're gonna focus most of the time on iNaturalist. Just give a shout out if you're having any issues or can't find anything. If I hit explore, I'm just looking at where we're mm -hmm. at, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So on my phone, it automatically takes me to my observations, um, but I can click, there's like three lines in the top left corner that I can click and explore is the first option. Um, Somebody already took a picture of a cliff swallow at Penkitter. There we go. And that's nice because it starts off by exploring your location so you can kind of see all the different things that have been found right where you are that your students might also be seeing. That's cool that they saw a cliff swallow. Mm -hmm. hmm. Somebody also marked the freshwater jellyfish in the back like back in the woods. A jellyfish. Yeah, I, I know there's freshwater jellyfish at Beltsville, but I don't know, there's, I don't know how it would be there. Is they're showing the middle of the woods. Unless so there's must, a stream that cuts mm, through that we should be. know about. Seek and iNaturalist the same? Seek is made by iNaturalist. Um, so you can log into Seek using your iNaturalist account. Um, because the seek the seek one came up on the phone, uh -huh. but the iNaturalist didn't. But it does say seek iNaturalist. Are they two different ones? Yeah, they are two different ones. Okay. Yeah, Wagner. If the kids aren't thirteen, they won't be able to register for iNaturalist. No, so I'm trying to get it on my phone and everything. No, I know, yeah. but I'm just saying the difference. Um, it should pop up. It's a little white icon mm -hmm. with a green bird in it. Um. I don't know if you guys can see my screen as well. That's what it should look like. Okay. Yeah, naturalist one. Fresh 
freshwater jellyfish. I'm still amazed by this. Yeah, they're really neat. I mean, like what, like I said, when I was at Beltsville a couple years ago kayaking, we saw some there, and I had researched it. But I mean, like I said, it's kind of weird. You would think maybe in a body of water like that, but not in a small body of water. But I don't know. Maybe. Right. Okay. Any high school teachers know about that? No, I, Mr. Pa I mean, Mr. Pasco, you were marine bio, but tell us about jellyfish. Like, in terms of freshwater or in terms of marine? Yeah. Do you know anything about freshwater jellyfish? I do not. I am not a limnology person. Um, I know they're in Pennsylvania in certain lakes. I, I think there's a big like a bog up there behind Penn Kidder, there's, or that's more like. There's a, well, there's one in Tannersville, the bog. Yeah, yeah, but I think there's like a bigger pond up there somewhere. Um, it's showing you know, Down Creek back there, but it, it kind of looked like it was off it, but maybe they mapped it wrong. I don't know. I, I don't know how they would end up in there though. Like I would think like lakes are much bigger. That's what I thought for them but I, I you know what i mean like there was a alligator in beltsville a couple of years ago too so you yeah. know <laughs> yes. you don't know what people are transporting freshwater jellyfish are really they're an invasive species uh oh, they really? originated originally over in china uh what the heck's the big river uh the Yangtze's river i think it is um and so they a lot of times they either come over as a pet released or in the bilge water of a, um, a tanker. And mm -hmm. when they flush the, the bilges in like the Great Lakes, that's where they got the invasive mussels and things like that. Hmm. Interesting. That is very interesting. I had no idea about that. Well, it makes sense that they would be invasive. A lot of the invasive ones start as pets. Not a good idea. Yep. True. Yeah. What do the color codes mean? Are All they right. animals versus plants? Yes. Okay. So that might be something when I first started, it made me really nervous. I had things that were coming up as red and then other things were coming up as green and I thought I did something wrong with the red ones. That's just how it's classified. So you have a different color for plants, for mammals, insects. Um, I'm trying to think, birds have colors. So you would see um, like little icons. You can look at the observations that you have made or that others have made and see the little icons to correlate. This is a fungi, this is a plant. And that would be where those colors come in. All right, so we're just gonna kind of click through the iNaturalist app for a little bit before we go out and try to make our own observation. Um, I have an Android, so I'm not entirely sure how it's gonna pop up on an iPhone. I only figured out how to create an account on an iPhone. So we'll see, some things might be in different locations, but let's go to where it would have the menu bar. Um, it would say how many observations you have made, your account name, like a little profile picture. Then you would see explore, projects, guides, hmm. settings. That's because you got to click on those three dots on the right and that'll give you the projects and the guides. Oh, got it, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to teach Mr. Pope here as I am learning. No, you said it, it helped me too. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, mine has like three bars in the in the top left corner. Um, I don't know how, in iPhone, is it, in, is it are they three they're dots? They're all down at the bottom. Oh, they're down at the bottom, okay. That is good to know. So we're gonna go check out the Explore tab first. Um, so I guess for iPhones, that would be in the menu down at the bottom. Yep. And it's going to automatically bring yeah. up things found in your location. You're going to see a whole bunch of pictures that pop up um, with different 
different species. It'll include the name at the bottom, the common name. And you may also see in the top corner, a green box that says RG. That means research grade. So if a scientist uh, or a research professional were looking to use the data from iNaturalist, you would want to take a look at the things tagged research grade or RG. Oh, see on ours, it just says research. Research, okay. Yep. All right, good to know. Um, as observations, um, we can input our observation and the community can agree or suggest a different ID for whatever we input. Um, and as it becomes more obvious that yes, this identification is correct and they have all of the things necessary, they have the location, they have the scientific name down to species, it's not just the genus or the family, um, that all of those things can help contribute to getting your observation to be tagged as research or research grade. Um, on mine, there's a little button at the bottom. I don't know where this is on iPhone, but it's a panel of uh, three squares and then what looks like a folded map. It's on the top on ours. The top on yours. So it just seems to be flipped. If you click on the folded map, you'll be able to see um, obviously more of a map of your location and then little dots that correlate with the location of what was observed. And you can pinch the screen to zoom in or zoom out if you really wanted to find the exact bog that the invasive jellyfish are in, you could go do that. Um, it starts as, at least on mine, it starts as a topographical map but you can choose the satellite image as well to really zoom in and you'd be able to see the number of cars that were in the PK parking lot or the exact maple tree in the parking lot of LB. And you'd be able to zoom in to find the pins. Um, you'd also see like a little circle with a radius mark on it and that is where you're located, like your phone physically. Oh, wow. Is this updated daily, Marissa? No. Um, oh. In terms of the observations? Yeah, like just for example, like there's construction going on here at the football field and I don't see any of the construction. Oh, the satellite yeah. image is not updated. So on my phone, it has me, um, my house is currently in a winter environment but if i go to work five minutes away it's a summer picture so it's not updated um very frequently but the observations themselves are updated constantly okay yeah i was gonna say on the map i can't see the garden out here at pen kidder and we put that in what two years ago so it definitely wasn't updated around us in two years oh wow <laughs> that's crazy as far as the you know, geographic. Right, right. I'm trying to think. I know when I zoom in on my house, I can find two cars in the parking lot. So like I know, and I can see my car, my husband's car, but um, yeah, it has us in winter. So I don't know if it was taken last winter or when. But the, the observations themselves are updated as you as you put it in. So if I were to input something right now and you guys all went to my location, you'd be able to see what I just put up. Okay. Right. So now where it says exploring all and then your location, um, you can click the little search icon and you could type in um, another location, or if you're looking for a specific species, it'll kind of filter that way and you can look up um, freshwater jellyfish and see where they have been found. Um, it also will show you the different icons and colors. So you can see plants are green, mammals are like a little blue mouse, 
insects are a little red bee looking thing. Um, and it gets, you know, you can input mollusks, fungi, arachnids. You can also see um, outside of that search function, the number of observations in your area, the number of species, because one person may be inputting five different American toads that they saw, um, the number of observers, so the individuals who have an account, and then the number of identifiers. Identifiers are people in the community who have gone on to someone else's observation and said, I agree with your identification or I'm suggesting a different identification. Um, if like um, I have hundreds of observations that I've made but only 30 identifications that I've made because I spend most of my time uploading things and I often forget to go and check out what other people have found. And then you can also filter it, uh, filter the location by showing only the observations that you have made, by showing only plants or only mammals, or by research grade. So you can filter and say, I'm looking for only the ones that can apply to a scientific paper or a thesis or something like that. So outside of explore in that menu again, for me it goes explore and then the next thing is projects. Projects are set up by an administrator and then um, it could be a project based on location or a project based on observer group. So I am part of, I, um, I also work part time for the local Audubon chapter and so we have one of our property where anytime I make an observation, it's tagged by location. So as long as I am within the set GPS coordinates of the property, it will automatically go into the project. So if someone was looking at, hey, what has Bucks County Audubon Society found on their property? You could go to the project and filter through there. It's highly recommended for teachers to make a classroom project. And that way you as the teacher can kind of monitor and help your students through their observations. And you can see, oh, Sam has uploaded five observations, cool. And it's filtered into your project. You can also look at projects near you to see, has the Carbon County Environmental Education Center do they have a project that I can tell my students to go to their site and make observations that would be included? And how do you create that project? Is there a way to do that it right on the um, Not that I have found on the phone. I, when okay. I have created a project that has been online, it's just inaturalist.org. Okay. Um, and then you just use the same login information and that's been where I have created all of mine. Again, I don't know if iPhone is any different, um, but Android doesn't seem to have that. Uh, but it also is a lot easier on a computer screen to kind of input the coordinates for where you want this location to be or input the users that you want on it. So once the project's created, Marissa, how would their students know to log on to that project? So depending on if it is a location project, if it's a location-based project, the observation, if it is within those coordinates, it's automatically inputted. If it's like a person, like if a teacher were to say, here's my classroom, then 
when you click on projects in your on your account, um, it comes up with joined, nearby, or featured. And I can look for projects to join. So the teacher would say, here's my project name, and students could search for that project and be able to click join when that project comes up. Yeah, it seems if you go under the nearby list, you could come up with like, there's tons of them around here that are, are listed. So that's where it would show up. So if I created one for my class, oh, okay. the kids log on, it would show up in that nearby list yeah. because it uses the location. Okay, I see. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and, and if they couldn't find it in the nearby list, because let's say you didn't focus on a location base because you knew some students, especially at the high school, some students may be coming from up near Lake Harmony and other students may be coming from closer to Lee Height. And um, so you didn't want to limit a location. You could also have, you have your set name, write it up on the Blackboard or on Google Classrooms, whatever you're using for virtual and they can just search the name as well. And it should come up if they can't find it in nearby. When you click on featured in projects, um, at least the last one on mine is iNaturalist observation of the day. And that's kind of a, cool project to join if you are almost looking for um, some really amazing samples of observations from around the world to kind of inspire your students or if you're looking to learn more about globally what people have found. That's a cool project to take a look at. After projects on mine, there's guides. And those are kind of like little field guides where if you didn't have an actual field guide um, to, to open up, there's little mini field guides right on here. One of the downsides of iNaturalist or even Seek is that while yes, you are getting your students to make more observations, there's a difference between using a field guide or a dichotomous key and being able to say, here's a leaf. Figure out based on the, the top side, the top color of the leaf versus what is the color of the leaf underneath. What, are the, what do the veins look like? How does the leaf connect to the branch? That would all help you identify something if you had a field guide. Whereas on iNaturalist, because it's, uh, like a photo recognition, it could pop up right away with what, what you see, what your observation is. And your students may not have to make more in-depth observations. So yeah, they're going around looking for things in nature to take pictures of, but the identification process often is limited in iNaturalist just because of iNaturalist skill at identifying things readily. So being able to tell your students to go to the field guide section and try to identify it themselves first before relying on what iNaturalist says your observation is can be helpful to get your students to go more in depth with whatever they're looking at. Um, you can create a field guide. Um, you can look for your own field guides on here. Um, I see Blue Mountain Birds pops up for me right away. If I were in the Blue Mountain area, I could open that field guide and see what birds have been found there, what some of their um, identifying features are. After guides, you see activity. And you can, um, you might not want to necessarily follow anybody unless you as a teacher want to follow all of your students or your students want to follow you but because this is a shared community like you could follow me and look at what i'm doing even though i'm in bucks county instead of carbon county now or you could look at what um like if you had as a science classroom if you had like a pen pal overseas 
that's also doing this. You could kind of follow them and be able to track what their activity and their observations have been. Uh, you also see your activity. So if someone has identified your species or helped um, agree with your identification, you can see that pop up. And then last is missions. And this is kind of more gamey. It kind of gives you almost like scavenger hunts where it'll say, hey, try to find these things in your area. So for me, it pops up, try to find an Eastern tiger swallowtail, a blue winged uh, scolid wasp, solid, solid wasp, a luvelia, a cardinal flower. And it scrolls through and you can kind of say, yay, I found this one, I found this one, and make it feel more like a game for your students to be able to find. Because games really help motivate students. They like the competition. Um, giving them, if you're trying to do like a unit with them, giving them like a bingo sheet of species to find throughout the semester. And- Did you say really that was good. called missions? Missions, yeah. Did anybody locate that on the iPhone? No. Um, well, mine, it's like a little flag. Hmm. I don't see that. <clears throat> Let's see. I am looking up where that might be. Hmm. If it is not on the iPhone, then it is definitely on the website. It's not necessarily phone specific, so it's just looking at where your location is um, and then saying, here are things found there. It's more of a game. It's not necessarily specific to you. Um, so you could always go to the website and have like it shared up on your screen at the start of the week. Here's the mission for this week. Um, and do it that way if you're not able to find it in your phone. We're getting a little short on time. So I do want you guys to go out and make your own observation and then we'll come back and talk about our experience creating an observation. So I'm gonna give, you guys are all in the, in the school. So like 10 minutes uh, or so to go outside, snap an observation. And oh, if it you is want, pouring. it is pouring here. It is pouring there. Never mind. Um, cool. I well, let's just go into observation. It looks like it's probably going to start raining here, too. Um, I have a greenhouse. So I could make one. There you go. You could just go into your greenhouse and do it. Um, but let's at least go through the process of how you would create an observation, even if you don't actually get to upload anything. Um, I was but, able to go online and create a project, so I did do that. Okay, you did, yeah, it's a lot easier to do it on the computer than on the phone. Yeah. Awesome. That's exciting. Yay. So on your phone, somewhere, you should see a little plus sign, and that's going to add a new observation. It'll come up with, do you want to upload a photo? Do you want to take a photo? Um, you can record sound, so if you're out in the woods and you hear a bird singing, you can identify by sound as well. Um, or in this case, we don't have a photo yet, but we're trying to 
figure things out? I think on ours, you have to hit the little camera with the observe. Okay. And then once that comes up, you can, then you can hit the little uh, photo if you want to put a photo on you already took. Okay. But I'm not yeah. sure about the sound. So, okay. So at this point, well, we don't have sound to upload right now. Um, and we're not going out to make our actual observations. So for just to explore and play around with, either don't upload a photo or just upload something that's on your camera roll. We don't have to save the observation. So, you know, whatever you uploaded a photo of doesn't have to be up on iNaturalist. Um, or just take a picture of your computer right now, just so that we can get further into the observation. Oh, and report. if you hit no photo, when that comes up, then you get all this other info you can fill in, I guess, which is the yes. same thing you would do if you yep. have a photo, right? So this okay. is the next step. Once you have your photo, or in my case, I didn't upload any photo here. Um, that's the data observation that your students would be filling out. Okay. So um, automatically, when I clicked no photo, it added the date, the time of 1037, uh, it gives the time zone as well. And it told me my exact location. I see my coordinates of my latitude and my longitude because it's assuming that I'm taking a picture right here, which is why having Wi-Fi is really helpful because if you don't have Wi-Fi in the middle of the woods, it's not necessarily gonna know where you are. Right. Um, but you can take a picture right away and then kind of save your observation for later. It'll save the picture, it'll save the coordinates that it tagged it in right there, but it just won't be able to finish that observation. Then if your students get back to the classroom or get back to their house, once they have Wi-Fi, they'll be able to finish their observation. So everybody at this point should be at this sort of place where it gives you all of your location, your observation details, whether or not you have a photo included. And then if you tap on what did you see, you can either type in what you think it is. If I took a picture of a, um, what do people get confused with? Oh, uh, if, if I took a picture of a swallowtail caterpillar and then someone was like, oh, that's not a swallowtail. It may have yellow with some stripes on it, but that's actually a monarch. Um, you can type in what you think it is or it'll say view suggestion. An iNaturalist, based on the photo recognition, will be able to say, no, that's actually this other species. And you can kind of scroll through the suggestions to see which one actually maps. When you go into those suggestions, you can compare pictures and be able to say, uh, have the pictures side by side so that you'd be able to say, oh, wow, this caterpillar actually only has black spikes at uh, two on each end, whereas the caterpillar I took a picture of also has black spikes in its middle. Okay, I know that one isn't the correct identification. Let me find which caterpillar is the correct one. So I'm going to- Lumpus homo sapien folk. So here I am, I uploaded a picture that I just had stored on my phone and I uploaded a picture. I know it's a bagworm that I found, but it's gonna come up with the genus. It's figured it out to genus. And then if I scroll through here, I can see all of the various species suggestions that it has. 
Once I click into those species, I'm going to click on evergreen bagworm moth and it'll come up with another image to say, is this, is this what you found? And you can scroll through the different images to see seasonally, the, right now the bagworms are in their bag, but later they're going to hatch out and become the adult form or the moth. So you want to see all stages of life. And then you can click select or you can click compare and compare will bring the pictures side by side. You can add notes to it of, um, you know, I found this, uh, I only ever find these when it's raining um, or other sorts of information that might be helpful for identification that a picture can't show. You can input again your location down to latitude and longitude. And then you'll see something that says, is it captive or cultivated? iNaturalist is specifically for wildlife, but in a greenhouse, you have something that's cultivated, it's still natural, and it can still be helpful to increasing observation skills. But you would just want to make a note that yes, this is a cultivated plant. Or if I took a picture of my dog, this is, a, this is not a wild canine by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you would put this is a captive animal, but you're still able to create an observation and learn more about it. Would this, would this work if you were taking a picture off of a piece of paper? Yes, I have taken, um, I've done paper, I've done computer screens. They're a little hard though because of the lighting, but I have been able to show kids paper and have it work. And this is all, you know, collaborative. So the more pictures and the more observations that you make, that your students make, that everyone in the world makes, the more accurate iNaturalist becomes with the photo recognition software. And then therefore the more um, accurate Seek will also become. Now, how did you say you saw the different um, like forms? So like I put up a picture of a monarch caterpillar Mm -hmm. but I only found a picture of the actual butterfly. So how do I do that? Okay, so again, when you uh, click on, like there will be the species suggestion or the genus suggestion and then the top 10 suggestions that iNaturalist has for you. Now is uh, that only if I don't type it in myself? Like I put my picture in? Oh, right. okay, you now I type it in, like it. Okay. monarch. It's just going to come up with a thumbnail. Once you click okay. into that thumbnail, you should see the egg, the adult, the caterpillar, all of the different instars, things like that. Okay. Chris, if I have a photo, I want to share it with this group. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Or do I have to create a project online? Right. So if I had a project set up for this group, then you'd be able to share it there. Um, but otherwise, it would just be out there publicly. You could always, um, it's very roundabout, but if you wanted on iNaturalist on your computer, you could send that link to everyone through email to click into. Um, if you are out and you find a freshwater jellyfish and you get really excited because apparently those exist here, um, you could always email that link to us and we could click into it and see. Or you could just let us know, hey, search Catherine Dahl on iNaturalist and look at my observations. We were talking before about the location with iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. So when I go into my observation <clears throat> and I take a picture of Mr. Pope and I put him up there and I find out that he is homo sapien and Good As I'm everybody. scrolling down here, there's a geo privacy section that says open. Right. So if I click on that and I turn it to private, does that give my students the ability to 
keep their location in private so that doing something like this, there's not a concern of people knowing where students are. Yeah, that will definitely help. The only downside is then their observation will not be able to be tagged research grade because location is necessary for that. But if you don't need your students to be, you know, getting research grade on iNaturalist, then there's no reason that they need to put that up there. This would just be more of a tool for them to learn how to do observations. Oh, yeah. Oh, so I see on my phone, once I'm inside an observation, there's a little microphone icon. That would be if I wanted to record a sound that I could do that there and add that to my observation. Once I successfully input an observation, I can go and on my phone, it automatically brings me to this whenever I log in of my observations. It'll come up with how many observations you've done, how many species you've been able to identify. Um, and then I'll show you with little thumbnails, the list of your observations, including the common name, if you are able to input that and the location, um, it doesn't give the coordinates on this, on this form, it just gives you kind of like the general region that you found it at. And then on the very side of it, it'll also say how many days ago that the observation was made. And there will be like a little number underneath that, that has like, it looks kind of like a just open book and that tells you how many uh, confirmations or suggestions that you have been given from the community members. So if you look at things that say, oh, there's three, I can look and see, okay, I took a picture of a spotted cucumber beetle and I had three people confirm and say, yes, that was a spotted cucumber beetle. I'm quickly gonna go through to this picture or this set of pictures here. These were two observations that I had made. One was tagged as research grade. The other one was tagged needs ID. I know what both of these are. I just happened to upload them because I just I really like iNaturalist and I just like uploading everything that I can to it. But I wasn't necessarily uploading because I didn't know what it was. Yet iNaturalist came back with the uh, mayfly photo here that I have on the bottom of the rock saying, yeah, it's not great. So when you have, when you make observations or when your students make observations, this is where you really want to keep the the photographic composition and the lighting in mind um, for the for the common buckeye. I have the wings are very clear. The background is not distracting. You can see its size in comparison with the flower. Whereas the, the mayfly that's on the right here, that's there's three mayflies in this photo. But due to the rock being shiny with water, the light doesn't, it's not great. I don't feel the flame. 
I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, it's it's all muffled. Seems like they booted her off. Is that better? That's it. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know why I got rid of my microphone for a second. Um, overall, what I was saying with these, uh, with these pictures here that I'm sharing, you just want to keep composition, photo composition, filling the frame and the lighting in mind to be sure that the photo recognition software of iNaturalist and the, the community members of iNaturalist can help identify a quality photo. All right, are there any questions for I've, me about anything? So if you go to explore, mm -hmm. so as I'm looking around on there, they're all color coded and some are plants, some are animals, but once in a while I come across one that's just a circle. That's just a circle. Oh, I have one of those too. I see that. Okay, so like it's it's not like a drop you would put on a map. It's just an actual circle. Is that what is the difference between that and the actual pinpoint? Because I'm looking at one right now that's a North American river otter. Okay. Hmm. And is that because I mean people are agreeing with it from what I'm reading? But, but why are some circles and one, some pin drops? Okay, so from what I know, it could be that the location was obscured. It wasn't made private. So the location is still available, but the ones that are pin drops are exact location, exact coordinates. That's what I think. Yeah, okay, that makes sense because the one that I'm looking at that's the river otter is is in the middle of a forest. Okay. Hmm. Right. And it'll be, let me see further if I can differentiate. Could also be ones that need ID versus our research grade. That's what I was thinking originally until... Oh, yeah, I see some that are research grade and some that are not that need ID yet. Okay, so I think circles. it's the privacy setting because when you go to that geo privacy setting that you mentioned that has private, you can also do obscured and that just makes it kind of vague so that, yeah, you have the location is there, but it's not. Um, so that could be the difference, but I can find out the exact difference for you. Are there any other questions about anything from today? Are you, are you going to mail the PowerPoint so that we can actually click on the links? Yes, I will be mailing this out. I also am recording this so that if there are other teachers you want to share this with, or if you want to go back through this later, um, you can look at the recording as well. I will also be emailing everyone all of the links as well. Um, and I even have a packet go away, well not a packet, a package of swag for everyone that I was supposed to give you guys. I was supposed to do this with you all day um, in person, but here, let me uh, go to, I have all of this stuff for you, um, laminated 
keys to macroinvertebrates. So if you guys were to go to Machuk Lake or the apparent bog behind PK, um, you can take that out there. I've got field guides, magnifiers, bug boxes. Candy bar? I can't, sure. <laughs> hey, I'm not hey, paying. Mr. Part. Peanut, that's <laughs> all you need. No, I, dude, I was going to give you guys lunch. I was He's so still excited. there. So excited. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, oh, go yeah, ahead. I have a whole bunch of stuff being mailed to you. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm going away today um, and I won't be back until um, mid September. So keep an eye on it for late to mid October. You'll be getting all the goodies. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, of course. But yeah, we'll be sure you guys will uh, be able to see the recording and the links that I can get to you in the next half hour. Thanks, Marissa. Um, of I know course. It's a full day of professional development and you had a kind of punt, so. Thank you. Um, of course. I, he's going to actually send me all the stuff to the district office and I will divvy it out to each of you once it arrives whenever it comes in September. Cool. Do you have any questions for Marissa? Nope. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm leaving.